Hello, everyone, and welcome to our study abroad session. Today, we are going to be exploring Asia. Having spent some time in Japan and China and Singapore, I can definitely tell you um, they're incredible places. We also have opportunities in Malaysia as well. Um, for sure, definitely, Japan is one of my all time favorite spots. If you're ever in Tokyo, is there's this buzz around the city and you definitely feel like you're in a different uh, different world. Um, I spent some time in Beijing and Shanghai and had the most incredible cuisine experience in Chongqing as well. Um, definitely an incredible opportunity to explore. Uh, Singapore, such an easy country to get around. You can hop on the metro subway and find yourself in a different part of the city um, whether it's little india or uh, walking down arab street or finding your way to um, to the botanical gardens uh, it's pretty incredible so i definitely encourage you all to keep your eyes open for opportunities in asia uh, we are going to be starting formally in just a moment um, we have our peer helpers on call here, and we're also uh, working to have some of our past exchange students join us as well. So, I just wanted to mention that uh, if you've come across this session, then you know that there's also opportunities to explore other regions, and there is the upcoming study abroad fair coming up in November. Uh, we're going to be putting together three incredible days of information sessions, hearing from past participants, and letting you know about some of the opportunities um, that are coming your way. Obviously, I should start off by saying that we are fully aware of the COVID-19 situation and that health and safety of our students is our main priority. Um, as you probably are aware, student travel at the moment has been suspended, as well as in winter 2021. We are looking at uh, opportunities for the summer, and we're hoping that by the time your application comes through, uh, we'll be able to get students back safely onto planes as well. Uh, I did want to mention that if ever you have a question about study abroad, you can always email us at cip at uoguelph.ca and we'll be putting that in the chat box momentarily. Um, as well, you can um, get in touch or have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with your education abroad advisors. There are education abroad advisors like myself who work with students in engineering and science, and we also have Chen, who is working with students in the arts and commerce and social science areas. Uh, so lots of opportunities um, to find out more information. I would also encourage you at this time to post any questions that you might have in the chat box uh, to keep this conversation um, a little more interactive. But I can speak to uh, Japan, as you were mentioning, uh, the, the cuisine is amazing. Um, you'll be able to taste like the freshest sashimi and go for real authentic Japanese food. Uh, it's quite incredible. Um, definitely in Tokyo, there's the area called Ropunji, uh, as well as the electronic section where uh, it's just video game galore. So it's pretty amazing. Uh, especially if you have the opportunity to move down to Okinawa. Um, Okinawa uh, is just this incredible influence of both Japanese and strangely American culture. Uh, it's something completely different from mainstream um, Japan, and I would definitely recommend that as well. Um, so I know that they're going to be opening up the PowerPoint again slightly. Um, I'm going to ask if Joshua is available. I know that Josh, who are a past exchange student, uh, if you could put on your audio and maybe just yeah, give I'm me here. Can you hear me? Uh, 
the audience listening, maybe some of your overall impression of what it was like to uh, study in Asia. Can you tell us where you went and maybe your first impressions or some of the early memories that you have from your exchange? Uh, yeah, I went to uh, ECNU in Shanghai and uh, the whole experience was uh, really amazing. Um, so I got to, as you were talking about, the food in Shanghai is also very amazing. Um, there's tons of things to do in the city. The city is massive. So there's, you know, every weekend you can visit a new museum, a new temple. Um, and the transportation in China is very good. There's trains that can probably get you to all different types of cities very quickly. Um, so I did a lot of traveling around China when I was there. Um, and probably one of the highlights, I uh, took a trip out to the Avatar Mountains, which are the, the floating mountains, uh, which was where they filmed the film Avatar. Amazing. One thing I definitely remember from Shanghai is just that you have like the futuristic architecture on the one side of the river, and then you have like this uh, European feeling of uh, in the French Quarter as well. What did you find interesting about this mix of cultures, particularly in Shanghai? Yeah, it is really. In yeah, you're right. It's really interesting. Um, even even further than the uh, old colonial buildings, when I went there, there was uh, so there's these old gardens which are from uh, I think like the 1400s or something. And as you're walking around them, you get to look up and you have the, the giant skyscrapers. Uh, I believe one of them is the second tallest, the Shanghai Tower is the second tallest building in the world. And so as you're walking around these old gardens, old imperial palaces, you have these like massive skyscrapers. But and the whole city is like that. So one street you'll go down and you can uh, you can have traditional food and then the next there'll be um, a McDonald's and stuff. So it really is a mix of cultures and stuff. So I'm, I'm interested. I mean, obviously, a lot of our students end up going to the UK or Australia or Central Europe. What was it about China that that was really appealing to you um, in your journey? Um, I wanted to go somewhere I think that would challenge me a little more. Um, I've been to Europe before with, on family vacations and so on. So I wanted somewhere to, that was going to put me out of my comfort zone. Um, I'm also an international development student, so I wanted to go somewhere that uh, wasn't, say, as developed as, say, other parts of the world and just see, like, how it all works. And I think from an academic perspective, I really enjoyed my time in China to see certain practices that are talked about in class actually in practice. Yeah, that's, that's interesting that you have an international development background. I'm sure you gained some insights in terms of globalization and sort of the interconnections between the East and the West. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes people think that if I'm going to China, I'm going to have to learn Mandarin or Cantonese. Um, how was it in terms of your classes and in terms of using English or perhaps your Mandarin or Cantonese to get around the city? Um, so at least that through ECNU, all the classes um, are in English. Except for, of course, uh, I did take Chinese there. Uh, highly recommend if you're if you're going there. Um, it's very helpful uh, to learn it. Not a lot of people do speak English, at least on the streets, like shop vendors and so on. But there, um, there's a lot of really helpful uh, translation apps that work great. And uh, I found that you know, after a few lessons, you start to learn how to order food and stuff because you learn so quickly because it's immersed. You're immersed in the culture and the language. Um, my language skills jumped leaps and bounds, I think, much faster than they would have if I was learning like a traditional course back at well. Yeah, that's amazing, Joshua. I, I know that we're going to be coming back to you in this presentation uh, to, to sort of pick your brain and get a few more insights. I'm going to bring it back to Jacqueline and maybe Jacqueline can uh, bring us up to speed with the presentation. Sounds good. I will. Uh take it from here and okay so today our presentation is going to land in China Hong Kong or um, which is also part of China Japan Singapore Malaysia uh, Vietnam and so let's take off 
We're going to start with China, and as Joshua has already kind of mentioned, these are some of the things that you might have to look forward to if you go to spend some time in China. So they have dumplings, which are pork filled fish or vegetables, and it could be great to check out some of the local cuisine there. There's the Forbidden City, which is the former Imperial Palace and home to the Emperor of China. And they do celebrate uh, the New Year, which is the most important festival in China. And it begins at the beginning of the Chinese lunar calendar, which is different than um, the calendar that we use over here. And so um, it's very, if you can catch a glimpse of some of these Chinese culture and some of their traditions, it'd be a great opportunity. For our next stop, we're gonna check out Hong Kong. So over there, they have fish balls, which are the most popular street food in Hong Kong. The Tai Tan, which is, symbolizes the relationship between man and nature and people and faith. And lots of skyscrapers. Hong Kong has the largest amount of skyscrapers in the world. So we're going to go off again, this time checking out Japan. Now Mike mentioned some of these things at the beginning of the presentation. So Japan has a large sushi um, culture, and so the traditional Japanese dish commonly eaten with your fingers or chopsticks. Uh, we also mentioned in our Norway or Scandinavia presentation that salmon sushi was introduced to Japan from Norway. So uh, it's good to see some sort of cross-cultural sharing amongst the countries. They also have Mount Fuji, which is the highest mountain in Japan, standing at 3,776 feet tall and vending machines. Japan has the highest density of vending machines in the world with over 5 million, and you can get drinks, candy, hot food, socks, and so much more. Get your boarding passes ready. Now we're gonna check out Singapore. So they have the Marina Bay, an upscale area of skyscrapers, luxury hotels, shopping malls, and is home to the Singapore Flyer Ferris Wheel. They have chili crab, promoted as one of Singapore's national dishes and can be found in seafood restaurants all over the island. And garden by the bay, 101 hectares of awe-inspiring gardens in the heart of the city. So we're gonna hop on board and check out what it means to explore Malaysia. So I'm gonna um, apologize for anything that I might mispronounce in this presentation. Um, but I'm going to try my best. So there's Hari Kebangshan, a holiday that spans the ethnic groups and regions and celebrates Malaysia's independence on August 31st. Batu Caves, a limestone hill that has a series of caves and temples. It is one of the most popular Hindu shrines outside of India and rendang, a rich and tender coconut stew, most commonly with beef that has been slow cooked and infused with rich spices. So unfortunately, we did have a student uh, from Malaysia who came to Guelph on exchange. Her name was Sonica and she was going to help us out, but we had some technical difficulties. So thanks for volunteering, Sonica. Sorry we can't hear from you right now. But for our last stop of the day, we're gonna explore Vietnam. So we're going to talk about pho, which is the Vietnamese soup that is popular food in Vietnam, often made up of broth, rice noodles, spices, and thinly sliced beef. Hu is one of Vietnam's most historic towns and was the seat of the Nguyen dynasty emperors and the national capital. And coffee. Vietnam is the second largest coffee producing nation and it has been a major source of income for the country. So that's a lot of what it means when you go and like travel and explore the countries, you're gonna immerse yourself in the culture, in the food, in the different sites. But when we're talking about study abroad here, and so what is it actually like to study in these different countries? So the countries, they have their own unique languages. For example, there's Vietnamese, Chinese, Japanese, Malay, and they all have their own different ways of saying hello. And you can see from this slide, uh, for example, in Malaysia, they often don't just say hello, it'll be hello, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Um, so even just different cultural traditions of how you greet somebody can change. But 
uh, as it was kind of talked about before, you don't necessarily have to speak the language in order to go on exchange to these countries. So they will offer courses in English oftentimes, and we'll show you a little later in this presentation where you can find information about the courses offered in English. But we do also encourage you to um, to take that opportunity to study in these different countries and learn the language of where you're going to. Joshua mentioned how it helped him pick up how to order food and um, immerse himself kind of in the culture there. And we can talk more about that later. So just like they have different languages, they also have uh, different currencies that they use. You can see the currency exchange rates for uh, the different countries here. And it's important to keep this in mind. That way you have an idea of how much one Canadian dollar will get you, for example, when you go to Vietnam or Malaysia. And so having some sort of conversion rate or easy rates that you can calculate before you go, I think would be very helpful. That way you know, um, or you have an idea of how much you're spending when you go to the shops or you go out for dinner and that kind of thing. So related to that, we wanted to compare the cost of coffee. So compared to the cost of coffee here in Canada, this is how much you could expect to pay. For example, when you go to Japan, 300 yen for a cup of coffee. When you first land there, it might seem strange to pay 300 of a currency, but uh, with the exchange rate, uh, it might equal out to be fairly similar. So in terms of money, we also want to talk about the cost of living. So compared to Canada, it'll, you'll find that the cost of living is cheaper in Vietnam, China and Malaysia. But if we're going to look specifically at rent, rent is going to be the highest in Hong Kong and Singapore. So, for example, a country that has a cheaper cost of living than Canada, when you go and study abroad there, uh, you might find that you would spend less than an average semester at Guelph while you're studying in China, for example. So cost of living compared to the rest of Asia, Hong Kong would be the most expensive, followed by Singapore, Japan and China, and then Malaysia and Vietnam fall lower down on that list. So I wanted to pass it over to Joshua for a second and ask, uh, how did you find the cost of living to differ compared to Canada? Uh, I found the cost of living to be a lot cheaper, but I probably would spend the same, but that was because I was, I had the ability to take a lot of trips, like I took an airplane trip along with uh, like train trips, and also I was mo trying to do a lot of things, so I would like do different tourist attractions each weekend and stuff like that, as well as I was eating out the whole time as I didn't have access to a kitchen. Right. I think that's uh, an important point that Joshua makes is just when you're creating your budget, make sure that you're budgeting for those extra things that you might want to do. For example, if you want to take a trip and fly somewhere else, or if you want to go out um, and do experience things and do things with your friends that you make while you're there, make sure that you factor that into your budget. So if you know that the cost of living is going to be less, like maybe you have a bit more flexibility and a bit more room to do these um, extra things when you're abroad. So, of course, we have to talk about scholarships as well. So when you're studying abroad, you're going to pay tuition to the University of Guelph. So whether you're studying at Guelph or you're studying in China, you're going to pay the same tuition and you're still going to be eligible for OSAP and bursaries and scholarships that you're regularly eligible for on top of the travel scholarships and bursaries that are offered through student financial services. So there are um, potential scholarships that are available. We have a group of partner universities in China and that's offered through the OJS program, which is um, kind of like a group of universities where uh, the University of Guelph and other Ontario universities are partnered with them. So there's the potential for scholarships. If you want more information, you can contact our office and contact information will be at the end of this presentation. We'll also look at the credit system. So regularly a full time semester here at Guelph is going to be 2.5 credits. If you go to China, you could be looking at 12 KGU. Um, Malaysia is going to be like 18 units. 
20 modular credits in Singapore, 15 credits in Hong Kong. So you can see that the credit system can differ based on where you end up, but um, most students when they go abroad, uh, you're going to pay full time tuition here at Guelph. So whatever a full time semester looks like at your host university, that's what we encourage encourage students to take. But at the same time, you're not required to take full time courses, but you are going to pay full time tuition. So keep that in mind. In terms of semester dates, that's another thing that can change depending on where you go or even the host university that you tend. So in China, what we call our fall semester, they might call semester one. And that's going to run from September to December, so fairly similar. But their semester two is going to run from February to June. In Japan, they have the fall semester, which is September to January, spring semester, which is April to August. And then for Japan, we do actually have several summer programs that run from June to August. So this is a good example when we look at their spring semester of April to August, where that doesn't line up with a typical winter semester here at Guelph. So it's important to look at this when you're considering the different host universities, because um, if you are planning to have a regular winter semester and then go and work a part time job or um, do a co-op placement, for example, during the summer months, if you apply to go on exchange to Japan, that might not be the option and you might have to look at shifting your dates and looking at other options. So make sure that you keep that in mind. We'll show you a little bit later where you can find the semester dates at each of our host universities. For Singapore, they have semester one, August to December, semester two, January to May. So even though it starts in January, it might run longer than a typical semester here at Guelph. And they also have a fast track program that runs during the summer. In Malaysia, they have a semester one of October to February and semester two, March to August. In Vietnam, semester two is July to December and semester one is February to June. So if you want to find out more about the different programs that we do offer, you can check out our website. It's listed in the top right corner here of this slide, uoguelph.ca slash CIP. And this is what our homepage looks like. On the homepage, you'll see a blue button down um, on the right hand side and it says study abroad program search. When you click there, you'll see the different filters that appear and below all these filters, you'll see all the programs that are available. There's over 120 different programs, so filtering some options might be a good choice to kind of narrow down your search. If you're interested in going to China after you hear about Joshua's experience, maybe you want to filter by the country or the region. Uh, if you want to filter by your field of study, that's an option as well. If you filter by the field of study, a lot of students do ask if they're restricted to those options that are listed. And the answer is no. It just kind of depends on the credits that you have available and what you're looking to take when you go on exchange. If you're looking to take core courses and credits that might fit into your degree here at Guelph, then filtering by the field of study might be your best choice. If you have a bunch of electives that you're able to choose uh, from and you have more flexibility, then you'd be able to uh, be open to options that are outside of your field of study. So um, just kind of keep that in mind when you're considering your options and if you have the ability to save electives, that might be a good choice for you uh, to consider if you are interested in study abroad. So after you go through all the options and you filter some out and then you pick a university, when you click on a university, you're going to find a page that shows up just like this one where it'll show you a map of where the school is located, the semesters that you're able to study there, the fields of study that they offer, the language of instruction, and underneath the map you'll see there's a yellow box and that's going to be where you can find the semester dates. So it's important to look at those. And you also find here a link to the, um, the host university's website, as well if we have information about courses that are offered in English at this university, this is where you'll find the information. So the program search tool is very helpful in narrowing down the options you may be interested in. 
So let's talk a little bit about the different partners that we have in each of these places. So in Hong Kong, we have Hong Kong Polytechnic University and Lignan University. In Japan, we have uh, Kwanzai Gaokin University. In Singapore, we have NUS. In Malaysia, we have USM. And in Vietnam, RMIT University. And in China, we have a number of universities because as I mentioned, we're part of this like group of Ontario universities that is partnered with this group of universities in China, um, along with a couple others. So in terms of this group of universities, uh, it's called the OUI application or Ontario Universities International, and the China specific group is OJS. And so what this means for you is that um, if you're applying to the exchange programs through OJS or some of their summer programs, language programs, research programs, there's going to be on top of the CIP online application, there's also a paper application. And these paper applications uh, usually have different deadlines based on what program you're applying to and a different deadline than the CIP online application. So you can find all of the application dates and deadlines on our website under application instructions. And uh, if you have any questions about this OUI application or what this means, feel free to reach out to our office. So now what we're gonna do is, uh, we're gonna talk to Joshua a bit more and see what his experience was like uh, studying abroad in China. Um, but before we do that, I'm just gonna share this slide about our contact information. So for today, we're gonna be here until 3.30 to answer any questions that you have. And please feel free to send any Q and A's, any questions that you have in our Q and A chat, and we'd be happy to discuss them here and answer the questions. So please feel free to keep those questions coming. If you have more questions after this presentation, please email cip at uoguelph.ca or visit our website, uoguelph.ca slash CIP. And even though we're not in the office right now, uh, myself and our two education abroad advisors are available if you'd like to book a one-on-one -on -one virtual appointment with a member of our team. And you can do that through this link here, uoguelph.ca slash CIP. And then that's our website if you navigate to the About CIP tab and then check out the CIP staff page. Um, that would be a great way for you to connect with us. So now I am going to ask Joshua some questions and if you could just kind of um, elaborate on your experience abroad and maybe help answer questions that our students have who are listening. Uh, so Joshua, the first question that I'm going to ask you is what made you decide to apply for a study abroad program? Like, how did you start this process and get interested in this opportunity? Um, well, uh, I've always wanted to do a study abroad program. Um, I think with my program, I probably uh, might be working abroad in the future. And so I definitely wanted to go out and see if I had what it takes to have that experience to be, you know, living in a different culture and to be far away from home. And so had you been far away from home and lived abroad before or was this your first opportunity for that? Uh, this was my first opportunity to live abroad, yes. For a and, sorry, so how did you find that adjustment period to actually living on your own and living in a completely new country where maybe you didn't speak the language fluently and whatnot? Um, it's, it's pretty easy. Um, I found because you have, uh, there's a whole bunch of other students who are uh, the other exchange students in that like cohort and they're all in the same position as you. So they all want to make friends. They all want to, you know, hang out and stuff. So um, it's easy to make friends and connections there, I find. I think that's a really good point in that the other exchange students are there for the same reasons. Like they're kind of looking for the same experiences that you are. So did your host university create opportunities where you could meet the other exchange students or how did you get to know them? Um, yeah, I believe there was uh, like social events and stuff at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and along with the, like, uh, in, at least when I went, 
yeah, the university, uh, it's they're quite small classes, and so you get to know the other people within your uh, student exchange classes quite well. Um, and so you meet people through that way. OK, so you say uh, student exchange classes, like were the courses that you take that you were taking geared towards exchange students or were they a mix of exchange students and domestic students like local students there? Uh, mine were for only exchange students, um, but they had local students come in. I think that was mainly due to the language barrier as mm -hmm. the normal classes I know were all in uh, Mandarin. Yeah, that makes sense because I know, I guess for most of our other partners that do offer English speaking courses or like in the UK, for example, where I went on exchange, you are mixed in with the other um, domestic students. So those opportunities like the social events are great ways to meet the other exchange students. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that is a fear of a lot of students is making friends when they arrived. And so you said that you made friends while you were there and you made them through these social events. Did you find that you made connections with these people quickly? Did it take time or what was the actual experience like of meeting people? Um, it was pretty quick. Um, also, there was a group chat that the university set up where all the students were added in. So people were getting to know each other beforehand, uh, figuring out like where they were living, if maybe they were sharing a dorm with someone. And I think because everyone is coming in without their own friends there, they're very quick to make those connections. Everyone wants someone to sit with to eat and that kind of thing. So it's very easy to uh, meet, meet people. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a good point because so when I went on my exchange, I went to England and uh, like you said, I went there without any friends and I'm somebody who usually would take time to open up to other people and meet or make connections and make those friendships. But I found in that instance, because of the unique situation that you're in, there was friendships that were formed on like day two of the experience. So it was a very quick thing. And I think, I think that that's probably a common experience that you make friends quickly because it's such a unique opportunity and everybody's there for the same reasons. Um, no, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So I think you talked a little bit about your experience at the beginning of the presentation, but I just wanted to ask what specifically drew you to China and why did you pick that place to study abroad? Um, well, I main uh, wanted to just go somewhere that would challenge me. It wasn't necessarily China per se, but I just wanted to go somewhere that was be further out of my comfort zone than Europe or the UK personally for me. Um, and so when I got accepted into the China one, that was the, uh, the perfect place. Yeah. And the culture in China can be quite different than our culture here in Canada. So how did you find the adjustment process um, when you arrived there? Um, you know, you approach it with an open mind and stuff. You know, if something's different, you know, be patient with it and that kind of stuff. Uh, go with the flow and that, um, you know. Keep your expectations kind of low and stuff and be open to like the new ideas and different ways of things working. And I think that you'll have an easier time adjusting to the culture. I think something that's interesting is so so I did my first study abroad opportunity. I spent a year in England and then I was able to spend three months in China. So I've had the experience of kind of doing both of those different opportunities. And something that I found was interesting was that when I went to England, I knew that the culture was going to be fairly similar to the culture here in Canada, both English speaking, whatnot. And um, there was little differences in the culture there that really, uh, I would say kind of like, I wasn't expecting it. So I was very shocked and I had maybe a stronger reaction to the difference than I was expecting. Whereas when I went to China, I was expecting things to be different and I was expecting to have that adjustment process. And so when things were different, I was less, I don't know, I had less of a reaction to it because I was expecting it to be different. And I went into it maybe more with an open mind than when I went on my exchange to get the UK. So I think uh, um, maybe like the mindset that you go into these experiences with can differ based on 
what you know about the culture or what your perceptions are about the culture before you arrive there. So what would you say, like what sort of perceptions did you have about China before you arrived? Were they, what ended up happening? Was it different? Um, yeah, and how were your perceptions, I guess, challenged? Um, I think what surprised me is um, the very, the high level of technology they have there. Um, you know, I guess sometimes there are certain images of uh, underdevelopment that come up when you, you think of China in some ways, but it's it's very developed. I, I know when I went away um, and I went to like one of the national parks, I mean, I had cell service everywhere. Um, in China, you pay for everything on your phone, which is very different. Um, basically, it's almost cashless. There's like a food court in the mall. There's no way to even pay with a card or with cash. It's entirely through your phone. And so that's sort of an adjustment. It's nice. Um, so reliance on your phone, technology, different things like that. That's pretty neat that they're almost cashless there. That's a huge advancement. And so uh, the city that you were living in, was it a rural city? Was it more of an urban city? Uh, what was the environment like where you were staying? Um, it's very urban. I think Shanghai has something it definitely has 20 plus million residents. So it's it's huge, physically huge, which and population wise. Um, but there's a lot of really nice parks there. Um, so if you do need an escape from that urban environment, you can go to the parks, um, which was nice. Um, yeah, but it's very, very urban. Um, and also, but they have a really good public transportation. So they have the subway system, which is really good. I think it's one of the largest subway systems in the world. Um, I can tell you when I came back to Guelph, I certainly missed the uh, fast subway system waiting for the, the 99 bus. <laughs> I bet. Did you have an opportunity to go on, is it called the bullet train, the really fast train? Yes, yeah, I took one of the bullet trains and I think it took me two hours, a trip that would normally be about five hours. Wow. That's pretty yeah. neat. And so the university that you were attending, was it in like downtown Shanghai on the outskirts or where was it? Um, it wasn't the very center downtown of Shanghai, but it was definitely in more urban area than the suburbs. So I was very lucky because I know that it's one of the few universities that is closer to the core. And so that was very nice to have that kind of big city atmosphere. Um, and also be fairly close to things. I mean, most things, I'd say to get to the, the downtown core, that the very heart of Shanghai, um, take maybe about 20 minutes on the subway, give or take. And did you stay in residence there? And like, was the residence on campus? Um, so I actually did, ended up not staying on residence, um, although a lot of my, um, the other people, other exchange students did. I uh, ended up uh, staying just off campus in student housing that is recommended through the university. And I like that a lot because uh, it helped me immerse even more in the culture as I didn't have, I didn't just stay on campus a lot of the time. I know some exchange students did, you know, so I had to go out to eat at the different restaurants and stuff. And I think that just helped, you know, immerse myself in the culture, which was something I really wanted to do when I went over there. Yeah, that's a great opportunity. So if you're if you say that you got to immerse yourself in the culture while you're there, what did a typical day look like when you were on exchange? Um, well, I'd get up, I'd go to class. There's morning classes. Um, I think I had like class every day um, and then I would usually stay on campus, meet up with friends, have lunch, uh, afternoon classes and then uh, I'd go, uh, maybe I'd go somewhere afterwards. Um, the weather's really good there, I found, throughout most of the year, up until December, you get 20 plus degrees, so it's really nice. You're still able to do stuff outside for uh, a good portion of the year. And when you were checking out the local restaurants, did you find that it was a wide variety of restaurants? Did you find that it was mostly Chinese food? And also on that point, I know if you compare like the Chinese food here to the Chinese food when you're in China, my guess is that it was quite different. 
Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's definitely different. Um, uh, the Chinese food, there's a huge amount of vari variation. Um, but if you're not a fan of Chinese food, there, I mean, there's still McDonald's on every corner. There's Starbucks is on every corner as well. So if if you are feeling a little homesick for um, your uh, a latte or something, you can still get that as well. That's a great segue. So did you feel homesick? And if you did, how did you deal with it? Um, I didn't suffer from like a lot of homesickness. Um, I think because there's a lot of stimulation going on, it's a lot of new things. Um, and so you're always on the go and stuff. Uh, but, you know, I think just, you know, calling video chatting with your friends, family back home is just a good way, you know, to connect and stuff as well. If you are feeling the homesick. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I know when I was uh, studying abroad that there was, I was able to go on a bunch of weekend trips and like during the week I joined the rowing team and I tried to be involved in a lot of things. And then there was one weekend where my friends were going somewhere, I think it was in Italy, and I just decided I didn't want to go and I just stayed home and I kind of like did my own thing, had a more relaxed weekend. And I think if that's something that you find that you need, it's good to kind of schedule in those opportunities where you don't do anything and you just kind of have your own downtime. You don't have to be doing something every second of every day if that's not what you need for yourself. So there is so much that happens when you're studying abroad and there are so many opportunities that presents itself, but I think picking and choosing the ones that are right for you can be an important balance to find when you're abroad. But I completely agree that getting out there and doing things is a great way to kind of combat any homesickness that people are feeling. And technology is great these days. So something with uh, going on exchange to China is that it can be uh, it can be hard to kind of fit in when you don't speak the language, you don't look like the locals there. And so did you find that there were any stereotypes that you um, faced as somebody who didn't uh, maybe meet the typical uh, Chinese local res resident or what was your experience like when you were there? Um, well, luckily Shanghai does have a very high, uh, it's probably the most um, culturally diverse city in China. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I mean, there, um, there's not a lot of scams either or anything like that. So I, I never felt I was treated too differently, at least definitely in any negative way. Mm -hmm. I found it was it was all positive and stuff. Um, sometimes when you do go outside of the larger cities, um, people want to take pictures with you um, just because you're different, I guess. Um, so that can be something and I would usually just, you know, I try to accommodate and just make sure and stuff, but it's just something to be aware of. But if someone is taking a picture of you, it's, don't really think negatively about it, I guess. Mm -hmm. They're just interested. It's not a... Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's a great perspective and great way to uh, look at it. And it's good to know that the area you were in was diverse and that you felt, I think you said you felt safe while you were there. So I think that's an important point too. Mm -hmm. Um, so you did mention that part of the reason why you sought out a study abroad opportunity is because you see yourself working abroad or internationally future in your future career and things like that. So how do you think study abroad impacted your future career? Um, I mean, I learned a new language uh, as part of it, even if it's just a little bit. That's always helpful for future career. Um, I don't know so much career-wise, but definitely academically. I'm even thinking of uh, potentially doing like a, a master's in China. They do have some good programs there, so that's something. And uh, also, I think it would look uh, it looks good on a resume as well as uh, it's a good test to see if you can live somewhere else if you are considering to ever work abroad or move further away from home. So when you say like to test if you could live abroad. What kind of things do you think you're testing? Like what skills did you develop from this experience that you think would help you in the future when you live abroad? Um, cultural understanding, you know, when cultures are different and stuff, different things. And also 
I think whenever you travel, just uh, unexpected problems that sometimes arise and how to deal with them and stuff on the fly. Things don't always go to plan, but you work away your way around them, and I think that's an important skill to learn as well. Yeah, I think that's very true. I think like adaptability and flexibility are common terms uh, mm -hmm. when studying abroad, because you just kind of have to go with what happens, and make it work. Um, so when you were in China, and I guess the daily life was fairly different. And so is there anything that you did when you were on study abroad that you've kind of taken back with you now that you're home and try to incorporate it into your life now? Um, well, I cook um, Chinese food every now and again, um, and there's definitely certain like uh, other food items. I know uh, I'm lucky enough there's a, a Chinese market uh, in my city, um, which I go to now quite often. I was actually really happy to see they have like certain drinks and stuff that I thought I probably wouldn't be seeing again unless I went back to China, which was nice. And I've uh, tried to keep up my uh, Mandarin as well, just through online learning as well. So I continue to practice that. And I uh, am still in contact with a lot of the friends I made when I was over there. Oh, that's great. Do you have a favorite um, dish or recipe that you make? Um, yeah, uh, like the chow mein with the noodles and stuff, but uh, in like the style that they made it uh, on the streets in Shanghai, which is like with a peanut sauce and stuff is uh, really good. Oh, that sounds delicious. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you said that you're still in touch with a lot of your friends that you made from studying abroad. And do you find that like these these friendships are ones that will continue over the years and they like, I don't know how to say it, but like these are people that you think will continue on and like you'll be friends with them for a while? Uh, I hope so, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know from my experience, like when I made my friends on study abroad, it's, I said it before, but it's such a unique opportunity that these memories and these times that you shared with these people are going to be something that you remember for a while. So I know for my own self, um, those friendships are something that have continued, even though I studied abroad a few years ago. So I guess as we start to wrap up this uh, session, I'm just going to ask you one last question of, is there anything else that you learned through your study abroad experience that you would like to share with our listeners? Um, definitely do it. Um, it was a great experience and I'm very glad that it was part of my university, uh, time in university that I did a study abroad and I would definitely recommend it for everyone to do. I think there's always a good program out there and I think you guys will help them find it. That's great. Thank you so much for uh, helping us today and sharing your experience with us, Joshua. I think that it will be very helpful for anybody who's considering going to China or going over to Asia. And um, yeah, just thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right, perfect. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And Anybody who is considering study abroad, you should know that uh, the next steps in the process of studying abroad would be to attend one of the, or sorry, not attend, but to complete the online info session. So in order to do that, you can send an email to CIP at uoguelph.ca and you can find all of the instructions on our website. Um, so after you attend, the info session, our applications will go online in early December. So in early December, if you've completed the online app, online info session, sorry, um, you will get access to the application and there you can pick out your top five choices. And so right now we recommend that you use our program search tool in order to kind of find the choices that work for you. Um, if you enjoyed this presentation or if you're wondering about what it would be like to study abroad in the UK, that's what we're going to explore next week. And so that we hope we hope that you will tune in next week at the same time and join us for that session. If you have any other questions um, between now and then or at any point, please send an email to CIP at uoguelph.ca and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you everybody for attending.